In our review of scientific objectivity, the first thing I want to do is clarify a simplistic picture of scientific objectivity that many people have in their heads. This is the idea that individual scientists are passive receivers of truth about the natural world, that all they need to do is follow the scientific method, and out of that pop subjective knowledge. This is just not how science works. I hope that this much has at least started to become clear to you through the course. When we analyze something philosophically, it often helps to start with a very simple formulation and then refine it. As we dig deeper into the nature of objectivity, I'm going to follow this strategy. So let's begin with a simple picture. Scientists discover facts about the world through observation, experiment, and simulation. Before critiquing this view of science or trying to make it more nuanced, I want to zero in on some of the key terms here. So first, let's talk about the term fact and the closely related terms belief and truth. Facts are true by definition. Facts are representations of how the world truly is. Now contrast this with beliefs. Beliefs can be true or false, or they can be neither. They don't by definition have to represent how the world really is. They can be wrong. They can also be about things that aren't matters of truth at all, but matters of opinion. Now in an ideal scenario, our beliefs about the world line up with how the world truly is. And in that case, we might say that we have true beliefs about the world. In other words, beliefs that corresponds to facts. So to recap, facts are what is actually true in the world. Beliefs can be about anything. They can be about facts, they can be mistaken, or they can be about opinions. And true beliefs are beliefs about facts. When we grasp the way that the world actually is, we believe the truth. But remember, we can also have mistaken or false beliefs. And sadly, all of us hold on to many false beliefs. And more importantly for this class, Scientists can also have false beliefs. They can be wrong about the facts. This points to an absolutely essential and foundational principle of science. There can be a difference between what scientists believe to be true and what is actually true. Beliefs change, hopefully moving closer to the truth, but the facts remain the facts. We use scientific methods to grasp the facts, but we can be mistaken. So clearly, scientists can have mistaken or false beliefs. But one question is, can they do everything right and still have false beliefs? And this question brings us back to an idea we started with, the idea that an objective scientific process should lead to objective knowledge about the world. If we try to remove our own personal biases, are we guaranteed to have knowledge about how the world actually is? Are we guaranteed to know the facts? The answer, sadly, is no. The history of science shows us many cases where scientists made turns that we now believe are wrong. A good example of this was Einstein's false belief that the universe was static, or Hubble's inaccurate calculations about how fast the universe was expanding, both of which we talked about earlier in the course. Both of these scientists were aiming to be objective, but they still failed to produce knowledge about how the world really is. Since scientists can try to be unbiased and still sometimes fail to discover the facts, it would be better to formulate our statement of scientific objectivity in terms of aims instead of in terms of achievement. So we might say, Scientists aim to discover facts about the world through observation, experiment, and simulation. This may seem like a minor change, but by adding the word aim here, we are fundamentally changing how we think about scientific success. Instead of defining success as a matter of discovering facts about the world, success becomes a matter of aiming to discover facts about the world. As a consequence, instead of thinking about scientific knowledge solely consisting of facts about the world, it's better to think about scientific knowledge as that's what's generated when scientists aim to tell us what the world is like, and not necessarily only when they do. To be clear, it's important to see that objective isn't synonymous with good and subjective with bad. We expect all kinds of judgments to be subjective. The best flavor of ice cream, whose children are most adorable, the best hockey team. These judgments wouldn't be made better if we removed our unique perspective. That's the whole point of them. Scientific investigation, however, aims to tell us the facts about the world. So scientific claims ought to be objective. This doesn't mean that scientists don't use values in their quest to learn about the world, however. They do. And some of these values actually help scientists generate knowledge. And these are what philosophers call epistemic values. So what are some of these values? Accuracy is one of them. Scientists want to make their theories make accurate predictions because that indicates when their theories are right. For example, climate scientists look at how increased greenhouse gases have warmed the planet in the past and then make predictions about how much the planet will warm if we continue to add these gases to the atmosphere. For the most part, these predictions have been accurate. 
The IPCC's fifth assessment report, published in 2013, looked at previous IPCC report predictions and found that, I quote, the trend in globally average surface temperatures falls within the range of the previous IPCC projections. So this tells scientists that the theory of global warming is likely an accurate representation of what is actually going on in the world. Simplicity is another value that many scientists follow in their work. Scientists often want their theories to be simple because they think the simplest explanation is often the right one. Simplicity, or the principle of parsimony in biology, is a good example of this. It's often applied to evolutionary trees, which explain how a common ancestor evolved into a number of different species. Biologists tend to think that the tree that has the least number of branches is probably the way that speciation actually occurred. So why is this? Well, the principle of parsimony is based on another assumption, that nature aims to be efficient and economical. So we've talked about epistemic values, but I also think it should come as no surprise that scientists are human beings like everybody else, and they also hold on to other kinds of values, personal values, and biases that could negatively influence their work. In a paper she wrote about gender issues in science, the philosopher Kathleen Okraluk illustrates how this may have happened in biology. She talks about what she calls the Sleeping Beauty Prince Charming model of fertilization, which assigns a passive role to the egg and an active role to sperm, much like the traditional view of men and women. It turns out that this model might not be so correct. The egg does appear to play an active role in fertilization. How did scientists figure this out? Well, they uncovered previously ignored research, research that may have been ignored because of societal gender biases. So did sexism affect how biologists thought about fertilization and what research they paid attention to? It seems so, though that view did change when future generations of researchers uncovered previously ignored research. So at this point, you might be wondering, how is objectivity possible at all? As human beings, is it really possible for scientists to abandon their perspectives and their values when they enter the laboratory or the field? Well, clearly the answer is almost certainly not. The best individuals can do is try. But as many of the examples I've given illustrate, communities of individuals are another story. For the rest of this section, we're going to be talking about some of the ways that scientific communities, not individuals, can both aim to discover facts and also can aim to rid science of bias. And we're going to see that this should be viewed as a process that unfolds through time. To explain this process, I want to introduce a couple of other terms that relate to scientific objectivity, but aren't really referring to the same concept. Sometimes scientists talk about how confident or certain that they are that their theories represent how the world is. For example, in the first part of the course, we discussed the latest IPCC report, which says that scientists are virtually certain, meaning at least 99% sure that natural causes alone cannot account for the observed global warming since 1951. But climate scientists weren't always virtually certain about this claim. As they amassed evidence and continue to amass evidence, their confidence grew. The IPCC reports are also huge collective endeavors where thousands of scientists have critiqued each other's work and come to a consensus on what's causing global warming. Their level of consensus corresponds to a certainty about the facts, a certainty level that's been revised over time. Similar statements could be made about other examples of science we've discussed. Scientists are quite confident, but not virtually certain, that the universe is about 13 billion years old. Pinning down the exact age depends on measurements which are very hard to make, so as they continue to make these measurements, their estimates may change because the level of consensus in the scientific community may change. When scientists hold the same beliefs about how the world is, that is, when they reach consensus, it suggests that their beliefs are true and that they correspond to the facts. And the main way to get consensus is to critique each other's work, to eliminate the biases that may swing the evidence one way or the other. So finally, here's a final revision to our claim about scientific objectivity. The scientific community aims to discover facts through observation, experiment, and simulation over time. And it does this by eliminating biases through the critique and the accumulation of evidence. I think that this is an accurate and realistic statement of scientific objectivity. It makes objectivity an aim, it puts the locus of objectivity in the scientific community, and it suggests that the community has to revise its beliefs through time in order to make science better. Now, how exactly does the scientific community achieve this? That's what we'll talk about in the next part.